Well, we want once again join with JD and welcoming everybody here. Appreciate the good message that Brother JD brought to us. It's uh, worthy of great study and it sets a good example of how we should approach any study of the scriptures. We're in First Peter, as was noted earlier. And last week we left off at about verse 8. So I want to back up to verse 7 and emphasize a point here as we move into verse 8 of First Peter chapter 1. You may not have noticed this, and then again you may have, but you can see that Peter discusses much of the same thing that James does in the letter immediately preceding First Peter. I would suggest that you might want to go back and forth between the two and just see how much alike they actually are. Both James and Peter would have worked diligently and for the most part all of their work among the Jewish Christians and among the Jews to convert them to Christ. So they would be saying much the same thing. This also lets us know that any time we teach from a body of truth, that we're going to say a lot of the same thing. Truth doesn't change from person to person. It's the same. Now, people may use illustrations and such things as that different from one another, but they're going to illustrate the same truth. They may use examples, but it will be using examples to teach the same truth. So it's not unusual then that people would have done that and that inspired men, the men who wrote the Bible, inspired of the Holy Spirit, would have been drawing from the same body of truth. And thus, as they wrote these letters, they wrote them to individuals and to churches concerning living according to that same body of truth, the life that it produces which is the Christian life as members of the church. So now, as we pointed out last week, Peter's greatly concerned about the greatest. He calls it trial of your faith. Their confidence, their belief, their trust in God and Christ and the whole New Testament system is going to be put to a test. I dare say there are any of us alive today, at least those who are hearing me immediately, I don't know who may hear it overall when it comes to where it will go on the internet, but I think you'll see that we rarely, if ever, as I said, the people who are in this particular class right now, have ever faced any trouble like those brethren did. They faced it originally from the unbelieving Jews. Then as you read through in Acts, Paul's preaching cures as he, the apostle of the Gentiles, carried the gospel to them. The Jews many times would stir up the unbelieving Gentiles, and they literally did terrible things to the apostles and to the brethren in general. Well, as we said last week, we think this could very well be tied in with the persecution brought about by Nero Caesar. Whether it is or it isn't, it's going to be something that's going to be visited upon all these that uh, Peter is addressing. Notice Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, all of those, as I said, are in what used to be called Asia Minor, but in the modern state of Turkey. The, this is the same area that you find the seven churches of Asia that are addressed in Revelation by John. So it's very important to understand that it's one thing to have local persecutions to where, such as Paul uh, was stoned or put in jail or whatever, but it's another thing to have the state make you completely illegal and to be hunted by the state, and to be engaged in something the state says 
is just simply wrong and you're now a criminal. So the trial of your faith. Remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. As to whether you're right or wrong or I'm right or wrong about something to do with Christianity depends upon just what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches explicitly in just so many words, and it teaches implicitly. And that's the only way the Bible teaches. It, in fact, it's the only way a language communicates the will of somebody else to anybody else. And it does that through direct statements, uh, examples, and through implication. I say again, that's the only way a language can communicate the will of somebody to somebody else. And if you're going to understand a language, you not only must be reasonable in knowing how to think through a thing, but you need to understand the words and how they're used. That's why that we will refer many times to the original languages in which the Bible was written. Because we want to know how, what it meant when the Holy Spirit used it. So we might realize then that as the Bible furnishes us unto every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, then it furnishes us with the wherewithal to overcome manifold temptations or trials. These folks' faith, our brethren of almost 2,000 years ago, their faith is going to be tried. That is, their trust in God and Christ. Well, that doesn't just mean do you assent to the fact of the existence of God or do you assent to the fact that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God and Savior of the world and anything else that the gospel system reveals and teaches. It carries with it the idea of will you continue to obey Christ when they threaten you with all sorts of privation and hurt, all manner of things, as you read up in the scriptures and from history also, are you going to continue to obey him? Will you confess him publicly when doing so may cause you to be put in jail? And you don't face those things nowadays because God is probably there has allowed us in America to enjoy freedoms protected by our Constitution. That's not the case in many parts of the world. And throughout history, it's simply not been the case much at all. So the trial of your faith. Notice we said last week that if you make gold pure, you pass it through hotter fire and it burns more than impurities out and it gets to be uh, pure, more or purer. So the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold because gold perishes like everything else of this present material world. And Peter talks about that. He says, the elements shall melt with fertile heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Well, notice when you talk about being tried by fire, that means there's, it's a pretty tough situation you're about to face. But he says, when your faith is tried, you want to make sure you keep on keeping on. They tell you don't preach in Christ's name anymore. You preach. It doesn't mean you're foolish in what you do because you have other scriptures that tell you see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time for the days are evil. So you use wisdom as to how you do things. Nevertheless, you still must do them when it comes to those things that are obligatory in becoming a Christian and in living a faithful Christian life. You don't give them up. Notice he says that it be tried with fire. It might be found under praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. When does the Christian look to receive his final eternal reward? Well, if you're looking for it in this life, you're very, very short-sighted. And on top of that, you don't understand the truth 
concerning why we're pilgrims in this world a sojourn. Notice that we are going to receive the praise and the honor and the glory as Christians at the end of time, the day of judgment, when our Lord says, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. Now, we enter the joys of thy Lord not as we are now, but as resurrected faithful children of God with a body as our Lord now possesses and into the rewards and blessings that our pitiful human language cannot begin to describe their magnificence and their glory. And he says, that's when you're going to receive it, not here. So don't let anybody cause you to deny the faith. Don't let anybody cause you to cease doing what God requires of you to be faithful. Then we come to verse 8. Notice the sentence began back up in verse 6, and it continues on here in verse 8. Concerning Christ, he says, now when he appears, that's when you're going to receive the eternal reward. Whom, that's Christ, having not seen, you love. None of us have seen Christ with our fleshly eyes. The only way we can say that we've seen Christ is to have seen him through the truth of God's good word. And thus we talk about the eye of faith. And thus that faith, according to verse 7, is going to be put to the test. And it's going to be put to the test by men who care nothing about the faith, who care nothing about the Bible or God or Christ or the church, anything else about it. And they're going to try to get you to turn loose of all of this or even put you to death if you don't. Or they needed then to call to mind what they knew of the gospel concerning what all Christ went through, how much he suffered for them. They needed to walk in his steps. And Peter will say that later on. He's left us an example that we should walk in his steps. And he says that in the context of suffering. It's true we should walk in the steps of Christ in all things. But he said that particularly, we'll get to it later, in the context of suffering for the cause of Christ. He's left us a pattern to follow. So he says, whom having not seen you love, in whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, there it is, verb form of faith, faith's the noun form, yet believing, you rejoice. You rejoice because of your faith. The faith that we have comes from the source of faith. Again, we cite Romans 10, 17. And thus Paul could say we walk by faith and not by sight. We don't let the things around about us trouble us. But we look at who holds the future in his hand. Who controls all things? And of course that is God through Christ. So with joy unspeakable and full of glory. I said earlier there are no human words in any language, never has been or they're not and never will be that can fully express the glory and majesty and honor and power and might and beauty of the glory of God. Glory is an interesting word. As my mind recalls it now in the, in the Greek word, doxa. It carries with it the idea of, of that which is magnified beyond our comprehension as to the majesty and glory of, of God. I like to think of how it's described in the book of Revelation in, in many symbolic terms. When you get, I think it's Revelation 4, and the great throne room in heaven is described. And you see the symbolism and figurativism there set forth the glory of God. And um, this is the thing that we're being taught to think about. You rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And here's why. Look at verse 9 receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. I think we ought to take that verse and put it on everything around us where we are all the time 
so that we can see it because we don't receive the end of our faith until the appearing of Christ. And the ultimate of everything about the Bible and whatever it produces is the salvation of your soul. Nothing else matters. That's why Christ came to seek and save that which was lost. The prophets all prophesied of it as the Old Testament down through hundreds of years developed and shows us a marvelous, wonderful scheme of redemption. We ought to be concerned about the salvation of our souls more than anything else on this earth and what it takes to make sure that we're saved eternally on the day of judgment. Now we get into some interesting things because he builds upon the salvation of your souls, the saving of your souls. And in verse 10, he says, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied the grace that should come unto you. Searching what? Or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify? When it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. And that ends our sentence there. This is beginning to tell us something about the inspiration of Scripture. That man, in and of his own volition and power, did not write any of the scriptures. These people, the prophets, and we'll read more about that a little later in the verses to follow these two, they knew they were writing as the Holy Spirit guided them. them. They understood they were not writing of their own learning. So they searched. Now when you look at search, you see, it's a very diligent effort because the Old Testament writings did not give us the details that sometimes we think it did concerning the Messiah, his kingdom, and so on. You see, it's hard for us to remove the knowledge we have in the New Testament from those prophecies of the Old Testament concerning Christ and his kingdom. If we only had the 39 books that make up the Old Testament and the prophecies of Christ his kingdom in them, we would be a whole lot like the Ethiopian eunuch as he read from Isaiah 53. And you can see a little bit of that pondering. He's wondering. He's trying to figure out of whom speaks the prophet this, of himself or some other person. And he desired Philip to get up in the chariot and guide him. And they did. And Philip began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So the prophets look. And you can see others who received what they produced searched diligently. But even the prophets who received these prophecies searched them diligently. Because they inquired. Notice that searching and that inquiring they inquired and searched diligently. And notice they prophesied, it's interesting how he says it, they prophesied of the grace that should come unto them. Remember, Paul said to Titus, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying in godliness and worldly lust, we should live righteously, righteously soberly, and godly, in this present world or this present age. Well, it's interesting that he uses grace here to mean what man does not deserve, man cannot merit, but it's freely given of God, even while man, as it were, were at war with God, still in his sins and rebelliousness. So the prophets were looking into all these things, trying to figure out when they would take place. Notice, searching what or what manner of time, time, the Spirit of Christ. They knew that this was to take place in time. They didn't know the time. 
they were trying to figure it out from the very prophecies the Holy Spirit delivered to man through them. There again, testimony to the fact that this is revelation from God. This is not something developed by any man out of his own ingenuity or learning or any group of men. Searching water, what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them. Interesting, too, he says, the Spirit of Christ. Well, now all these prophets, prophets that he talks about here wrote in the Old Testament. Well, he talks about the Spirit of Christ. Well, what is the Spirit of Christ? It's the Holy Spirit. You, we must not forget the very essence of God and his attributes. When we say there is one God, we're saying there is one divine essence. And there are three persons who make up that one divine essence. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. First, second, third person of the God. So when you see the Spirit of Christ, you see the Holy Spirit. When you see the Spirit of God, that's the Holy Spirit. And thus they recognized that the Spirit through those prophecies had delivered unto them things pertaining to their salvation through the Christ. And when was this going to happen? At what time would these sufferings uh, take place? Which is interesting because that's exactly what Isaiah chapter 53 talks about, is the sufferings. And they wanted to know when is this going to take place? When it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ. But then notice it didn't leave it at that, and the glory that should follow. Remember Christ in the garden, Father, glorify me with the glory I had with thee before the world was. Christ knew that what he had to undergo would be exceedingly terrible, excruciatingly painful, terribly shameful, he didn't want to go through it as a human being, if at all possible. But he knew that was the only way it could be done. And so he underwent all of that. But he knew that glory awaited. Now, Peter is writing this letter to help Christians, members of the spiritual body of Christ, brothers and sisters in the family of God. He wants them to understand that the glory awaits them following the tribulation. And for them not to be discouraged. You know, depression is a terrible thing. And our faith in God, when it's proper, when it's correct, when it's formed by the right and divided word of God, 2 Timothy 2.15, does a great deal to lift our spirits. It helps us look beyond all the present day problems and trouble and especially those that might come upon us because we love the Lord to keep his commandments and we're not going to deviate from what Christ has authorized us to believe and do. Well, that means there's a lot of things in this life we don't participate in, we don't support, and we give up. And other things we take on in order to follow the teachings of our Lord. Well, this is encouraging people that when you're persecuted for righteousness sake, to realize there is glory to follow. Even this will pass away. And that's the way it's been. And James talks about that our life is like a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. Well, when times are tough, and especially when you're being persecuted for righteousness sake, we need to lift it up my mind and say, this is only temporary. This is just passing. It will not last. There's nothing that is of this body it's going to last. It's all going to be gone. Anything we're dealing with right now through our five senses will not be here someday. It'll go into oblivion by the power of the Lord when he speaks such so to be. But he that doeth the will of the Lord will abide forever. And that's what he wants them to focus on. And thus today, even if it's being sick with cancer or whatever comes along with old age, or even if it's early in life, you're afflicted by something that makes uh, living in the flesh a trial and a tribulation. Folks, it only lasts for a little while. When compared to eternity, it's not even a, a flash in the pan, so to speak. 
that's how we orient our lives. And that's how we learn to think of things. Now, worldly people are constantly thinking about the here and now because that's all they know to think about. They don't want to think about death because to them, that just ends everything. And many of them just think, well, uh, you know, I, I go into oblivion myself. The Bible's full of material that says that's not the case. And here's a letter written specifically to Christians who are about to be tried. Their faith, their confidence in God and Christ and the gospel system and every component part of it is being put to the test. Now, what are they going to do? Well, if they're short-sighted, they may give in. They may deny Christ. But notice, the prophets they would have been very familiar with who were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write of all these things, peered into them themselves trying to determine the time of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them which have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Now there's a number of sermons in that one verse, and I'm uh, tempted to make remarks on it, but I don't think I will. The point is, is that the prophets knew they were inspired of the Holy Spirit when they wrote of the coming Messiah his kingdom. They desired to know when those things would actually take place, especially the sufferings of Christ and when he would be glorified. And thus they searched diligently. They painstakingly, that's the idea, uh, sought to know the time. And yet what was clear about it? It wasn't for them to know. It was for us, as Peter describes Christian, to know those things. How so? Well, remember, I've already said, we have the New Testament. That's how so. We have what they never had. They did not have the wherewithal, no matter how diligently they search these prophecies to understand about these matters. But we have them. We have them, and we're looking at them right here and seeing why they were given, originally given to those brethren then and now to us, to strengthen us, to cause us to view life like we ought to, to be interested in things that many times take second, third, fourth, fifth place when they ought to be first. The things that abide, the eternal things, not the material, not the fleshly, not time itself, but to set our affections on things above and not on things on the earth. The things above don't just mean contemplating heaven. It means the things that pertain to life and godliness that Peter talks about. And we'll get more into that later. But just jot down here, verse 12 is a place to begin, the Lord willing, and our next time together. Before we leave, let's have a word of prayer, please. Would you bow with me? Our holy and righteous Father, we are so grateful that we can have this time together in which we've studied thy good word. And we pray that we, like the prophets of old, will search diligently to learn the things that pertain to life and godliness here on earth and the relationship we're to have with the affairs of this present world. Help us to recognize this passing quickly. Help us to set our affections on the eternity wherein is our ultimate final reward, that we can walk with thee forever in the plains of glory. Help us to recognize the uncertainty and brevity of life in the flesh and that it will terminate at some time or another. So help us to be faithful to thee, that we can hear thee say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye in the joys of thy Lord. Gracious Father, we come before thee offering this praise and honor, and being thankful for all these good things, especially the spiritual blessings we have in Christ. And when life's little brief time is finished, may we come to thee in glory, in due time, and according to thy will. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.